so hi everybody, thanks for coming. I really appreciate you are still here after almost two days of conference. And welcome to my talk. I hope everybody is here uh, already. So my name is Maciek Pruchniak, I work at Talk. We're kind of not so small software house based in Warsaw. We're about 100 people. And I've been doing mostly kind of integration stuff there for most of my programming career. And also quite a lot of Scala development. But today, I, I even gave a quite a few Scala talks, but today I'm here, not uh, three floors below. So today we'll be talking about something different, although the code I'll show you a little bit is still in Scala. So today we'll be talking about stream processing, how to, how to fit all those data that's flowing through our systems to, to some kind of manage, man, manageable shape. So to begin with, I'll tell you that at Talk we're mostly working for mobile op operators in Poland. Almost all of them, at least the, the big four ones, but also many smaller MVNOs. So our client that we'll be talking about is mobile operator. So what kind of data do does mobile operator typically have? Well, the first thing are billing events. If you make a call, send SMS, use internet, they almost always charge you a little bit. Of course, now we have uh, better tariffs with unlimited calls, but still it's a few, at least a few thousand events per second. Then the next big stream is kind of connected, stream of calls, SMSs, they know who you call, how long did it take, did you forward the call or did it end it abruptly? And also the network usage, when you use mobile mobile internet, the operator know how long your transfer took and even in fact they know which web pages did you access. I mean, probably most of them don't use it for kind of more legal reasons, but still they use it. And this is quite a lo large stream of, of data. And also data about localization of your phone, right? This is very, very interesting. Again, this is very interesting stream of data. If they come from calls and SMSs, this is not so large stream, like a few, few thousand again per second. But if we take account the communication that your phone makes with base transmitter stations, the streams get quite large, up to even, I would know, like probably half a million a second. But again, it's not so widely used due to some kind of more legal issue reasons. And of course, there are some kind of more modest inside streams of, of data coming from various uh, operations that you do on your account. You activate some data packages, you mm, switch on your, mm, your mailboxes and so on. So all of these data are gathered in, in, in mobile operators uh, uh, systems and how do we want to use them? Well, I'll focus on, at least we focus on here on two, two main subjects. The first one is real-time marketing, right? So firstly, we want to find interesting events in all the streams of data. For example, we can see that you are running out of your data quota and maybe we want to advise you to buy another data package or we want to try at least to detect that you are going to the airport and maybe, just maybe, you are going out of European Union, right? So you want another roaming package, otherwise <laughs> the roaming cost will kill you. Of course, it's a little bit more difficult to predict that first you are going to airport not just to greet somebody but to fly away. And how do we know that, that you are going away out of European Union? So it's kind of tricky, but still they are quite quite a few interesting events that can be detected on those streams. And secondly, we want to detect if you are the right customer. If your revenue that you give to operator is large enough, do you have tariff that, that preclude you from, from buying this or that package? Or maybe you are just kind of a VIP client and we want to just invite you to, to go to point of sales to get a coffee and we will show you a new iPhone model. Right, so we have to find interesting events, right customers, but most of all, we have to send you kind of message uh, almost immediately and not, for example, next day, as, as it is the case with batch campaigns, batch marketing campaigns, as it happens nowadays uh, for most of the operators, right? If we go to the airport, we have to send you this message immediately and not the next day. 
So from technical point of view, these processes are quite simple, right? We filter the data and we enrich them a bit in, in some kind of customer data from some customer profiles. The next, um, the next uh, area of our interest in is, is a bit more interesting. It's detection of frauds. There are many ways that people try to misuse uh, mo their mobile phones. There's frauds for premium usage, for spying through SMSs, like delivering stupid message to, to thousands and millions of customers. There's more elaborate frauds involving SIM cloning, SIM boxing, and many, many of them. And how do we want to prevent them? Well, first, of course, we have to detect them. And for that, we have to cal calculate pretty, sometimes pretty elaborate aggregates. For example, how many calls did you make in last, I don't know, few, few hours, to how many unique numbers and so on and so forth. For example, we want to also to remember when, where you last been, where have you last been, so that we can detect that maybe you did some crazy stuff with your SIM card clone then, and then you appear in five minutes in totally different region. And we can detect some suspicious transfers of accounts and so on. And then what do we do? Well, the first thing is we report it to, to certain monitoring systems, but we can also block your account, so you won't be able to make all those uh, calls. And this, from technical streaming processing point of view, this is a little bit more elaborate. We have lots of st stateful processing and quite a lot of counting on Windows, right? But the funny thing is that all this data processing is happening right now and was happening in mobile operators for many years because they have this big black oracle called billing systems which process data, all those data, pretty quickly, efficiently <coughs> and could, could generate all interesting actions, well, I would say immediately out of the box. So what's the problem? The problem was that this billing stuff, this is some legacy big black box from some big vendor and each change would take, I don't know, month, two months or even half a year. On the other hand, they also have these warehouses accessible by their analysts where they can perform almost any SQL query and that was kind of accessible for them and fast. But on the other hand, it was accessible, the data was accessible after, well, I don't know, a day or two days even, nowadays probably a few hours and it was its so obvious how to generate some actionable inputs, right? I mean, they could define some marketing campaigns, but it's not so easy to immediately send SMSs based on warehouse data. So, our goal is to combine the speed of billing with accessibility of warehouse, right? So, how did we do it? Uh, I'm mostly my talk is mostly based on on one deployment at one of the largest Polish mobile operators. So this is more or less our architecture. This is this. Here are the data sources. Here is Kafka and here is our stream processor Apache Flink. And then we send some messages, generate some monitoring events. We also have some additional, uh, additional caches for, for customer profiles and our tool, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Yeah, so this is it. So what's the problem with this architecture? <coughs> I'll get to that in a moment. But first, let's look at the main component. This is Kafka and Flink. I'm sure most of you know Kafka because it's kind of, don't you? You do probably. Because it's now it's more, more or less de facto standards for message passing in, 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 in high, high volumes. And it works, it's great. Maybe not so well known is Apache Flink. How many of you are using Flink? Oh, few people do. So those of you who, who don't know what Flink is, you can think about it as Spark streaming. That works kind of better, right? I mean, Spark is, is de facto standard for, well, for badge distributed processing, not so much for streaming because in streaming area Flink also competes quite good, although I think Spark is catching up pretty quickly. So why did we choose Flink? Well, it was two years ago and Spark was nowhere near so usable as it is now uh, with respect to streaming. 
So we chose Flink because it provides us with very low latency processing, exactly one semantics. It can handle massive state and it's got real nice API for handling state and windows and so on. Right, so one of the key key features of each stream processing stream processor is the ability to to to, to perform mm, all those window computations in case of systems crash. So this is this is not trivial stuff that probably we don't want to do ourselves, right? And former generation of stream processors weren't so good at that. For example, Storm or stuff like that. And also <laughs> Flink has pretty well designed system for handling out of order data. It's quite complex, so I won't go into that, especially with mobile operators, these data are structured pretty reasonably, but there are quite a few advanced uh, features in Flink that enable you to do it correctly, right? And it provides us with nice DSL. Just probably as you would do in Spark, you have nice Scala API that lets you just define the flow, right? So where is exactly the problem with Flink? In fact, there's no, <laughs> not so much of a problem. How do you, how do you create Flink, uh, Flink the pipeline, uh, how do you deploy it? Well, just like we would do with Spark, so you code, you put your program to jar, and then you deploy it by some kind of API to job manager. You can think about it, of it like Spark driver. And then it distributes the task to, to nodes in the cluster. They are happily processing. And the job manager is, uh, <coughs> is responsible for scheduling all your jobs to, uh, to different nodes of cluster. And, and, uh, and it's responsible for handling state, which is probably stored to some high available this store like S3 or HDFS, right? So this is our kind of basic architecture, how you would do it. But in our case, it was not near, nearly enough because this is great Scala DSL, which is pretty accessible, but for us programmers, right? And for poor business analysts, well, not so really. You, you could hear like I ago on Luna presentation that it's not so easy for, for business guide domain experts to, to code, right? And this is again the case uh, with our deployment. Even more so, more so in our case, we are a software house, right? And our client is somewhere else. They have business people, they have operations somewhere in the basement, and they have some kind of IT team responsible for the tools and analysts. So there are still boundaries between them, but these boundaries, are kind of easier to cross, right? Because they are more or less in the same building. <coughs> the obvious guys are in the basement, but it's not, not, so, not so bad. But here, the boundaries, it's much more difficult to cross because we're in different company. And the more they pay us, the better for us, but worse for them, right? So they don't want us to code. And we don't want to code their business behavior because it's boring. So the history of the project is more or less like this. First, we developed POS proof of concept with, with Flink and the results were, were great. Everybody was happy because p performance exceeded expectations and so on and so forth. But a client told us, okay, so how will we change our business process, for example, for these marketing campaigns? And we said, okay, we'll give you configuration files. You will edit it and the, these changes will be automatically uh, applied and you'll be okay. Uh, I mean, okay, it will do, but, but what if we want to make bigger changes? So we said, okay, so maybe in these files you won't have configurations. You'll be able to write some Scala expressions. Scala is easy, don't worry. You'll be able to write it and we will compile it and deploy it, right? Of course it took quite longer because you know how long Scala compiles. And if you don't know, then just go downstairs and you'll hear for sure horrible stories. But our client said, okay, uh, it can be, but your competition from IBM or SaaS has this nice graphical user interfaces and you. So he said, okay, we'll build you a 
user interface and you'll only pay half price and the code will be ours and we'll conquer the world with it. So our client said, okay, just let's do it. So we paid. So, so we made this GUI. And this is it. This is Token Snacker. And well, first we thought it will be our product, but then it turned out that, you know, we're development teams, we don't have salespeople, so we thought we can't sell it. Let's make it open source. So it is open source. If you wonder what is New Snacker, it's 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 in German, because Flink is from Germany and Flink's logo is Squirrel. And sometimes you need something more than Squirrel, you need New Snacker. The owner of our company invented that term, so we had to accept it. Okay? So yeah, that's true. So, so how do we use it? Well, when we created that, we have kind of few assumptions. The first one is that we will still write integration, we'll still write code, we'll still write case classes, because it's it's kind of too responsible job to give it to business analysts. The second thing is that the business analysts, maybe not so much business people, but, but people who can write SQL code should be able to design a data flow in our application, right? So SQL is kind of a good point of of comparison, right? Because if somebody cannot write SQL, then what can he do? And yeah, come on, it's true. Or maybe Excel is also a good point of of reference. And the third thing is we wanted to facilitate, well, testing, ex experimentation, and so on. Because from different, uh, from former projects, we know that it's easy to make even analysts write something, but it's more difficult to make them be kind of brave enough to deploy it in production. And we didn't want to rewrite that code to check it and so on. Right? So how does it look like? Well, there's this business analyst. He uses our kind of web application for designing processes. We have some database, repos process repository, and then they are deployed to Flink and run happily ever after, right? So first, before this analyst can write anything, design any process, we have to write the code, put it in a jar, it will be Scala or Java code, we'll design model, we'll code, uh, we will code some integrations, We'll config, for example, where is Redis, where is Kafka, and so on and so forth. And then the business people will design process with, with our graphical user interface. We'll save it into JSONs, and they will be deployed in Flink. So it's quite easy and straightforward, nothing, nothing fancy here. And it looks more or less like this. Hopefully, if I have time, I'll do a short demo. But now, this is, this is our main flow. Right, so here's the source of the flow, here are some enrichments, some filters, and at the end, some things, where this data eventually goes. So the nice thing is that it's all drag and drop, and the users can take all these, all these blocks from, from some toolbox. There are some kind of generic stuff like filtering, split, switch, and stuff like that, just programming tools but also some kind of, I would say, domain-specific elements, like services for, of our mobile operator, enrichment of, of a, their client interface, and so on. So this is coded by us in this model, and then we make it accessible by, by this toolbox. And what is this model? Well, it consists mostly of, of, I would say, three things. So the first thing is the data, right? These are some Pojo classes, case classes, in the future, probably, that would be derived automatically from, for example, schema registry as some kind of Ebro files and so on. There's also sources and things, so we have to know where are the, where is, for example, the Kafka broker, where, what are the topics and so on, and also some enrichments or processes. So the interaction with, with all the other stuff if in, in this mobile operator's ecosystem, like, for example, uh, SMS gateway, or, for example, uh, getting some additional data about client. And then we, the mighty programmers, write some code that will define what will be the model and so on and so forth. It's more or less simple Scala code. And then, for example, we will write some service to, to, to be able to access client data through Redis. So we code some interface, we design 
parameters of, of the service, and then when the user wants to access it, they are given some same parameters to, to be able to, uh, so, so they are able to use it. Okay? And we even can have documentation if somebody, of course, is if somebody writes it. Okay? But what is this? We'll get to that in a moment, because all these building blocks are not everything, right? Because somebody has to code those exceptions which should be accessible for SQL guys. To write filters, define aggregations, define actions, how to send mail, what would be the, pff, the subject of the mail or, or the content of the SMS. So how do we define them? Well, we decided to go with something simple, something called Spring Expression Language. If you code sp in Spring, you know that there are some configuration, mm, configuration annotations that you can use, and you can use some simple expressions in those annotations to access configuration stuff. So we decided to use it, and it turned out is that they are accessible enough. Even more <laughs> kind of surprising for me that was that they are, uh, they are fast enough, because we invoke them like, I don't know, 200,000 times per second, maybe. And they do, even though they were written for, for dealing with configuration files. And the language is simple enough so that we can do m some validation and code completion. So we can find, uh, for example, some minor typing typos that the user does in, in expressions, and we can do almost like I wouldn't say intelligent style co completion, but something basic for them. Right, of course, spells have some limitations. It's performant, but sometimes, well, not performant enough. All these expressions are inherently synchronous. So in reactive world, it's sometimes a little bit, a little bit inconvenient. And the type safety is also something to, to consider because it's not so easy to type all those expressions. And if you ask why don't we use SQL, well, the first thing is that there was no good support in Flink for SQL when we designed it. But the second reason is that sometimes when you have this SQL expression, you want to have more detailed control. Why, for example, in, in, in one filter, why was this expression filtered out, right? You have three conditions, and with our tool, the users are doing some kind of pipeline so that they can monitor how many users are from Postpay, how, how many calls last less than 60 seconds, and so on and so forth, right? So there's, there is some value that the expression shall, shall are simpler and not just elaborate as SQL. Okay, but we've been talking about filtering and some basic stuff. What about aggregations, windows, and all the goodies that Flink has? Because it's not so easy to define them with, with this spell. And our idea is that the user cannot do everything. Because if our UI would be able to, to, to do anything, it would be much too complex and difficult to learn. So our idea is that we, as the mighty developers, define some custom, custom building blocks, some predefined aggregations, and users just configure them. For example, how long the aggregation would take, is it distinct or not distinct, and so on. But all these aggregations are written still in normal Flink API by developers. So it's kind of a trade-off, but I think it was worth it. Right? So now, now the process, the flow is designed. How do users want to test them? How do we want them to interact with it? Well, in some, in some cases, mobile operators are kind of you know, traditional enterprises with long, with long uh, flows when it comes to, to deployment, but sometimes they are more like COBOL-like. This is what I've heard once. So we first deploy it on production, see what happens, and then we'll deploy it on test and do proper testing. So sometimes it works out, sometimes not so much. Right, so how do we facilitate testing? So this is the normal architecture, right? We have production Kafka messages, production Flink processing, Kafka outputs, some warehouse outputs. We do, uh, we, we enrich the data with production Redis. And the first level of testing is like kind of a little bit between unit and functional testing. So we stop the sources of the data, we stop the outputs, and we dump them 
into kind of some, some kind of file, but we still use kind of production client profiles, right? So the users don't have to, to, to write all this stuff to, to, to make this test. And <laughs> from where do we generate the data to test? Well, there are two magic buttons. First button is test from file. So we assume that, for example, there's file with, with test JSON data. But there's also even more magic button that our users, I think they really like it, that enable them to generate data based on real Kafka messages. Because Kafka has great API, it's really easy to get, for example, last 10 messages from certain topic. So we can dump, I don't know, 10 or 20 messages, let the user test them into in some kind of sandbox, and then see what happens, right? So this is, this is really cool stuff, and they really use it. And then on the diagram, they can see which records were filtered out, what were the cause, what were the, mm, the results of, uh, of, of each expression. OK, so this is kind of a more or less like unit testing. But when they are done with it, of course, we have some kind of user acceptance test environment. So this is our more or less production environment. And then we have a big boundary and kind of smaller cluster where, where not, which is capable of running few, I would say, few or a few processes, but not, not, not all that run on production. And the great thing about it, about Kafka is that we can easily replicate production data onto, onto test clusters. So the users deploy it really on user acceptance test environment. Of course, they don't send real SMSs, they don't block real accounts and so on, but still they know how, how this the process behaves because we are using production data, also production client profiles. Okay, so testing is, after, after the process runs for, I don't know, like two or three days on in test environment, they are really kind of more confident that they can successfully migrate it into production, right? And when they are in production, of course, they want to monitor, is the process running, what is the latency, which which filters work well and which not so on, which not so, and if there are any errors. So we provided them with something, again, quite simple, with simple Grafana dashboard that, that shows some basic features, but the good thing is that it's automatically generated for each flow, right? So it's easy for user to, they don't have to, to define this, this Grafana dashboard, but they can just, it's just there, right? And we also provide some basic monitoring stuff apart from kind of more detailed stuff that we put into our Elasticsearch cluster. But some basic monitoring stuff, for example, how, how many events passed through uh, one or another node during the last day. So we still have 10 minutes, so I can do a really short demo to show you how it looks like. So this is, the screen doesn't look too good, but hopefully you can see something. Okay, so this is the source. We define from which topic we want to, 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 to get the data. We process them in parallel. Here we filter the transactions. This is our demo from, from our open source project, so it's not mobile operator based, but still, right? And I can do some kind of ID completion. I can see what, what fields are in the data or some, even some Java, simple Java docs or something similar, right? And, and I can filter out transactions that have more than 20, 20 something. And if I do some typo again, the error is detected, I think you don't see too much on the screen, but nevertheless, I can see on mine, right? And when I want to test it, after clicking here and there, here's some mm, example aggregation, right? So, so I, again, I define only some parameters, but the aggregation is coded in, 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 in this model. So I can, for example, also add some other filter, let's align to be good and okay let's let's leave this condition as true and now i want to generate some test data right i i pick that i want 10 of them and here in the file 
I have some JSON, uh, some JSON data, and drag and drop, test from file, and hopefully something will emerge. Okay, so here I know that 10, 10, 10 samples went into this node, and here only two, and here I can see what was the outcome of each expression and what what variables were used in uh, for this particular sample. Right? I will save it and when I done when I'm done I would I can compare how did I do compared with with former versions and then uh, I will deploy it to, to my test cluster, right? So this is what our analysts do. Hopefully, okay, it was deployed and now we'll see how does my process is going. I have some fictional data generator so I can see that what is the throughput, how many messages are passing each second, on which filters, here I can see on which filter how many of them are filtered out and also some maybe more technical details, for example, how does my uh, HTTP services are going. And this is also important metric for our analysts. Uh, what is the latency? What is the lack of processing? Are we, are we processing event after, after, I don't know, five minutes or five seconds? Okay. Oh dear. Now I'm really sorry about that, but I forgot about my battery and I don't have a MacBook but hopefully everything can be saved. I'm really sorry I forgot about it but don't worry, don't worry, it'd be okay. And the presentation is saved. So this is more or less how our tool works. You may of course wonder if we really use it in production. Well, I can assure you we do. As I said, we're working for one of the four largest Polish telcos and we've been using this tool for kind of one year. That happened before on this conference, didn't it? Is any? Yeah, hopefully. Don't worry. Okay. So it works much more stable way than this projector for one year and a half in production. And as I said, we use it for uh, real-time marketing and fraud detection, and we are on a good way to replace the former campaign management system and fraud detection. So it's used on quite large scale. Uh, in peak times, we process like 150, thousand uh, messages per, per second that is combined from, from all the processes. We have more than 50 processes deployed in production. This is combined all the marketing campaigns and, and, uh, and fraud detection systems. And our users can design quite large spaghetti monsters, as you can see here. I'm not quite sure what this process does, but they really did design it in this tool. So. Maybe they shouldn't do it and use some, some sub-process functionality, but still, well, they can, so they do, right? Okay, so uh, when I think why did we succeed in doing this, I can see too that important thing to remember is that we should start with something small and simple, right? We started with filtering events, only then we added some enrichment capabilities uh, like real-time client profile taken from Redis and only after that we move to, to fraud detection to design windows, aggregations and stuff like that. So we gradually moved from simple stuff to, to more complex ones. And also we started with something safe. We started with only generating events for monitoring system, only then we started to send messages or some notifications and now we are gradually moving to automatic blocking of accounts. Because remember, our clients are from, they are not from kind of online transaction systems, they are analysts from BI departments, so they are a little bit, I would say, scared about running things in production just like that, right? So it's important for them to stay safe. Right, and we achieved some kind of nice feedback cycle where the analyst first designed process in warehouse, then he implements that, 
in our tool, then he deploys it, or she, actually, she deploys it in, in uh, on tests, migrates to production, and then the feedback cycle is closed because we, we gather monitoring data and some adjustments can be made. Of course, there are some challenges. As I said, Spell is kind of nice, simple language, but it's not so, but it's easily misused and overused, right? If you look at that, I'm sure you won't be able to understand it. I cannot understand it either, although I wrote it some few months ago. So Spell is also can be easily overused and probably some SQL expressions would do better here. And also, we have to remember that we design some performance heavy processes, right? And these analysts don't always grasp all the, I would say, fling details, how the processes work. For example, the fling can, uh, can, can have state in memory or it can drop it to to some kind of HDFS, and sometimes you have to adjust the process so it, that it works okay. But I would say we are in the roles of, I don't know, DBAs, right? The user writes query, and then we will say, okay, your query is not performance, this is the way to fix it. So this is still our role. But the biggest problem is the kind of quality of data, because this is our flow. We take the raw data from uh, billing systems, we push it from Kafka, we do some cleaning, we do some transformations, and we put it into Flink. But on the other hand, the warehouse is given this data from some kind of battle-tested production-ready Python files, which do the same enrichment, we do the same cleaning. So this is some kind of discrepancy because the transformations are done twice. But remember, we are working for enterprise clients, this is battle-tested flow, and they are still not really sure that we are kind of, I don't know, responsible enough to be given this, this flow. So in the future, I hope that these two parts will be merged and that the flow, all the data will flow from the system through Kafka and both to warehouse and to Flink. But this is kind of classic dilemma of Lambda architecture, right, isn't it? So this was the part about our kind of main deployment, but what about NewSnacker as, as itself? Well, it's still kind of work in progress, as you can see, we're working really hard on that. But we have still a few more deployments. So our main deployment is Telco, not only one, but a few are in progress. But also we've been trying to, to use it in banking, we're working with a few Nigerian banks and then we, we try to use NewSnacker for fraud detections and also for some media outlets to, to do some online analysis of user data and so on. But uh, we're kind of on a difficult and saturated market. So we, we think we're somewhere in the middle between, uh, between use cases when you want to, to write real hardened production flows for example, when we are a startup and this is your core business, when you do proper testing, CI, CD, you have programmers that like write in Scala and so on, and between the use cases when you have analysts doing some SQL, Tableau, and stuff like that. So we are in the middle. The business analysts can still write, design our processes, but they are a little bit monitored than just random SQL, uh, SQL stuff. Okay, and we still want to, to write some more features, integrate better with maybe SQL, be able to more correctly handle joins of different streams, although it's surprisingly difficult even in Flink. Do some maybe governance because, you know, GDPR is coming and so on. And, and to let users define kind of models automatically based, for example, on Confluence schema registry. And of course, we have to write documentations, tutorials, you know, we're open source project and not so, so much big of a community. But if you can, you can try it out. I think it's, well, it's not so big projects. We have some demos, so, so you can try it in Docker, Docker containers. And this is how you can reach me. I'll also be somewhere, somewhere downstairs. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Maciek. I think, guys, we can have one short question before going to break. Okay. 
basically, I have a question how this compares to Apache NiFi. Have you heard of it? And yeah, yeah, we've been, we also use Apache NiFi, but we, in fact, in, in one of the projects, we use it along with, with, with Flink, but I would say that NiFi is more focused on data integration, right? I mean, probably you wouldn't want to, to code some some stateful processing there, it would be more more difficult, right? Well, one of the reasons, of course, is that when we started, NIFA is, was just emerging project, but I think that their focus is more on data integration, right? So, so now we have first NIFA pipelines that take the data from files, they kind of mm, clean them, integrate, for example, they send it to HDFS, and then uh, they send uh, the data to our Kafka streams, and then the analyst will take just prepared data from Kafka, right? Because I don't think that NIFI has some these testing capabilities and so on, right? Although monitoring is very nice. Well, yeah, you can basically run any script, and it can have testing capabilities of yeah. itself. It's just sort of interesting. So it's kind of similar, but I think a bit different flavor, right? <laughs> 